a secret Are we on? Testing. Can you hear me? Okay, seems a bit soft. Uh, how's this? Are we alright? Okay. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> okay, maybe wondering why I'm using a different microphone because I brought the one that I usually use uh, in Singapore because the, the band on that one is really tight. It feels like it's compressing my brains. <laughs> so my head slowly, by the end of the camp, will be like, like this, okay? So you don't want to see me like that, okay? Uh, it's not good for you, okay? You'll scare the children also, so... Um, yeah, yeah. So you can just leave it up there. <laughs> I would like to, actually, but I, I checked... Um, with the store back back home, they said they are out of stock, so I can't get a replacement. Because <laughs> I was trying to get John to tell him because it, this works with the, your your transmitter, yeah. So everything works actually; it just fits right in. Yeah. So uh, okay, so let's open our Bibles. We'll turn to First Corinthians chapter one. All right, First Corinthians chapter one this morning, and we're going to spend some time there. Uh, and. This will set the stage and the background for what we will deal with at the conference. So this is like a pre-conference uh, session, all right, just to get us off the ground and get us going. But at the same time, it kind of ties into some of the things that we've been dealing with yesterday and even this morning, all right. So I thought this would be appropriate to kind of get us on the footing. Now, uh, bear with me because I might, I'm trying not to go long because this chapter, as you can see, has 31 verses and I preach two messages out of chapter one. All right, so I'm going to go a bit fast quickly and I will skim and I'll pick out the more important stuff uh, without going into certain details so that it's uh, more relevant to okay, the, the conference itself and, and I, I think also one thing for the needs of this church, right? And what, what, you, uh, what all of you are going through right now. So uh, I hope this will be a, I trust that this will be a help and blessing. Okay, so we already did uh, we already did the reading, all right. So I just want to kind of focus in. Okay, let's do this. Uh, can we all stand and we will just read responsively the first nine verses, all right? First nine verses. Okay, and remember this will set the. F kind of frame our thoughts and all that for what we'll deal with at the conference. All right, I'll read the first verse and you, uh, you go on with the next and then we'll, we'll end in verse 9. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always in your behalf for the grace of God which is given you in my place. That in everything ye are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. Uh, so that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, together, God is faithful by whom you are called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Our Father, we thank you, Lord, for this morning, for the time of worship, for the lessons that we've learned, uh, from the teaching out of the Scriptures. And Lord, um, that's the reading of your Word. Lord, we thank you that your Word was given to us, pre inspired, preserved. It's, uh, it's still with us today, and we can trust every word. Because you have to promised to us that uh, you have given to us every word that proceeded out from the mouth of God. And Lord, I pray you help us this morning, that uh, in this message, that you help us to examine and to study it. And Lord, to know this for ourselves. And Lord, I pray that you use this to build up uh, even your church over here. Strengthen thy people. Empower me right now, Lord, with your Holy Spirit. And uh, Lord, uh, fill me with thy spirit that I may preach, not with the wisdom of man, 
nor the might of man, but with the wisdom and the power of God. And I pray and ask for the working of the Holy Spirit, Lord, to deal conviction in all of us, illuminate your truth, and then, Lord, I just pray that it will profit us and strengthen us. So, Father, we thank you. We commit this time to you, Lord, in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Okay, just a very quick introduction. Now, this is the opening chapter and the beginning of the epistle of Paul uh, who had written to the Corinthians, right? And uh, so this is a church that he had started in the city of Corinth. Now, Corinth was a city of commerce, right? There was lots of money floated, uh, floating around in, through the city, okay? There was business that was booming, all right? And the commerce involved the Mediterranean Sea, the Straits of Gibraltar, and uh, on, on the west to the port of Alexandria on the east. Now, this was a wealthy and prosperous city, all right? And... Uh, and this was, but this also led to corruption and perversion. And the Emperor Nero in particular was very comfortable there, but he ne- even though he never visited Sparta or, or Athens. Now, in terms of business, uh, it was in trading, banking, industry, manufacturing. All right? uh, one thing that they were noted for were the lamps that they made. Corinthian lamps were, uh, were an item okay? and were exported all over the Roman Empire. Okay, now it was also a capital, right? By 27 BC, it had become the capital of Achaia or Greece today, right? 20 years after it was built. Now, Rome profited from its trade, but it, it also offered military protection for its ports, right? There was a second Roman province uh, uh, for Greece, it was a second Roman province for Greece, and uh, it was called Macedonia, and its capital is Sin Thessalonica, right? So now, it was a city also of sports and competition. Okay, uh, there were two major athletic events there. All right, the Olympic Games and the Isthmian Games that were held every five years. Okay, so you, you may try to picture this. This is a very major cosmopolitan city. People coming through all the time, trade, business, banking, you know, sports, entertainment. But it was also a city of corruption. Okay, it was the home the capital, the home of the Temple of Aphrodite. If, you, if you're familiar with this goddess, or this myth, is, right? It's the goddess of sex, beauty, and fertility. Okay, the worshippers here used the services of uh, the temple prostitutes that were, and they numbered around a thousand priestesses, right? And public prostitution in the temple, it was a major part of the worship of Aphrodite. In fact, it had become so much a way of their life, okay? That it was part of their culture that, um, you know, it was considered normal, okay? To the Corinthians who were living there, uh, bef- you know, before they were saved, this was a normal way of living. So much so there was a name, in fact, there was a term, uh, when you call someone a Corinthian girl, okay? It was referring to a prostitute. Okay, the temple of uh, Asclepius, the god, is the god of healing, was also there, along with other sites for okay the worship of Isis, the Egyptian god of uh, sailors and Poseidon, right? The Greek version of that. Okay, it was full of drunken sailors because they this was a major port, which meant you know gambling, prostitution, and all that. Now, this was a very wild or what the world will call a very happening, a very exciting city. And it was here that Paul went and then preached the gospel and then established a church. Now, in understanding this, now most of the time when you and I read the commentaries and, uh, and hear the preaching about, the, especially the ch- about f- from, from 1 Corinthians, Many of us walk away with the idea that, wow, see, the church in Corinth was the worst New Testament church that ever existed. Now, the question we need to ask ourselves is this, is this based on our perception, right? Based on our prejudice, or is it based on Scripture? What does the Scripture have to say? And, and I want us to realize here that this is a church, right? The, the church in Corinth was a church that had many problems. But so does this church. So does the church that I pastor back at home in Singapore. So does every other church. If they were honest, 
yeah. about the spiritual reality. And what I want us to see today here is that we sometimes can run into the danger of evaluating and judging a church based on either the existence of problems or the absence of problems instead of asking a more important question is is God doing a work in the church? Is this a church that God is doing something and He's refining the church and He's taking them through and they're growing and they're maturing or are we maybe in danger of looking for marks of perfection that may not be realistic? Okay, and just to kind of kick things off here, my contention is this, right? As we deal with this chapter, I put it to you that here, when you do a close and proper study of 1 Corinthians and then go into the 2 Corinthians, you're going to see here is a church where the hand of God is on that church, is doing something in that church, and they're taking them progressively through stages of growth as a church because they are a legitimate church of Jesus Christ and God is doing something there and you see them grow, you see them go through changes and they are getting, progressing and they're better and better with every day, every week. Now the application of that also will apply to the individual because we can run into the danger of looking at ourselves or at one another, looking for what seems to be the outward mark of perfection which could be a mask, instead of looking for, is this person growing as the Lord takes him or her through stages of spiritual growth and maturity? I say this especially to the singles, because you could run into the danger of looking for someone who is outwardly perfect and you totally miss the reality. The reality is this, Real saints are not perfect, but they have a God and a Savior who is perfecting them. Amen. And that applies to the church that they are joined to. All right? So I, I kind of just want to frame the thought here because that helps us as we deal, and we're going to be dealing with, uh, in, in, even in, at the conference, right, issues about uh, issues in the church, problems in the church. Why do they exist? You know, does that mean that, well, this, is, this church is no good? You know, should I leave? Or should I look for another church? All right? Uh, why is my husband like that? You know, why is brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so like that? And what I want us to see here is that Paul doesn't deal with it this way. In fact, in his epistles, as he addresses these Corinthians, it was with the mind of helping them to grow, to mature, to become the kind of church that the Lord Jesus Christ wants them to be. All right, so let's get straight down to this. Look at verse 1. He addresses facts about the Corinthian church. Now, these are spiritual facts that he addresses to the church. Look at verse 1. It says, they were started by the Apostle Paul. It said, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother. Now, he writes to this church as the pastor, the missionary who had started the church. He addresses the church, he says, and that he is an apostle of Jesus Christ. Then he tells them in verse 2 that they were a true church of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 2. Unto the church of God. Amen. And how dare we say that, well, you're the worst church. Since they are a church of God, the church of God which is at Corinth. And you notice by implication in that verse, it talks about the local New Testament church, the church of God, where? At Corinth. In a particular place. All right? Now, notice, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus. So what's happening? God is taking them through a progressive process or transforming them to be more like Christ each day. They're being sanctified. They're set apart, right, for the work of God, for His service. All right? They were... They were already saved. And now, they're, now, you cannot have sanctification without justification. All right? You need to be saved. You need to be born again. But here, he tells them you are already saved. You're sanctified. God has a purpose and a plan for you. Now, he says, call to be saints. Wow. You realize he's telling them, look, he's not dealing... Okay, now, he writes to this church in the first epistle dealing with a number of problems. 
But, and, and then unfortunately, we don't have time to deal with all the chapters in, in 1 Corinthians. But as he deals with them in the first five to six chapters, now he addresses this from the perspective of who they are, not what they do. Who they are. What were they? They were sanctified. Says they were called to be saints. Why is that important? Okay, because many times the danger we run into as churches is that we focus so much on you must do this, you must do this, you must do this. Uh, you walk in or you join the church and there is an, uh, sometimes both a written and unwritten list of the things to do in order to be a so-called good or faithful member of the church. But Paul doesn't address the problems that way. Now, we understand they, they have issues there. There are some very serious problems in Corinth. But the way he addresses this is he tells them, look, don't you know who you are? Who are they? Called to be saints. Right? These are the ones who were set apart. Now, then he tells them, together with all that in every place, call upon the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. It says, you are saints, right? You are sanctified, you are saints. And then it says, together with what? That in every place there were others like you. Who were they? It says, those who have called upon the name of the Lord. It says, our Lord. It says, that's your Savior, your Lord. You have a master. He tells them, you have a Lord in other words, you are his servants. You are his disciples. Okay, and by the way, the word disciple is the most common word in the New Testament that describes a believer. It's not the word believer. It's not the word Christian. Not even the word saint. Disciple. Why? It describes a certain type of person. Someone who has dedicated their life to following and obeying Christ. This is, I'm not talking about work salvation, but... If there's someone is saved, they, the work of God, the trans, transformation, they become a work part, become now his workmanship in Christ Jesus, created unto Jesus, unto good works. Now they become a disciple. Now here he tells them, he said, look, together in every place, every place, call upon the name of the Lord Jesus, uh, name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Notice, both theirs and ours. Now, what does that mean? It says, he is our Lord, he is also their Lord. He's referring to the other churches. Now, this gives you a first clue about that church in Corinth. He's saying, you are no different from any of the other New Testament churches. You're not second class, third class, bottom ranking. It says, you have the same Lord. He's our Lord, he's their Lord. It says, you are saints. All right. Now, what is inherent in that message? It says, don't you know who you are? All right, you're set apart, you're saved, you're set apart for His work, for His service. Now live up to that vocation. All right, be that new creature in Christ, be a saint. Instead of, uh, He doesn't just come in and say, look, you do this, you do this, you do this. All right, because you have to understand, it has to do with our identity in Christ. You and I, now, I can come here, I can wear, a, you know, I can wear um, a barong, all right? I can even try to speak the language, all right? I can eat lechun, okay? I can eat rice morning, afternoon, and night. It's not going to make me any more Filipino. Because why? I will have to be born as one. He's writing to those who are born again as disciples of Jesus Christ. So many times we focus on, well, if you're going to be a faithful member of the church, you must do this, you must do this, you do this. And then we say we don't preach or work salvation, but we focus that you have to do all these things. But what I'm saying here is Paul addresses this from, don't you know who you are? If that's the case, be that new creature in Christ. Why? Because that new creature in Christ will do these things naturally. Right? It's part of the new nature. Now, so he tells them that, that, they, um, that here they were true church of Jesus, Jesus Christ. They were, they were saved members of that church. 
Right? The church of God in Corinth, to them, they are sanctified, called to be saints. The, the New Testament church is an organized assembly of the saints. And then he tells them they are fellow members of God's family. Look at verse 3. Grace be unto you and peace from God. Notice, our Father. And from the Lord Jesus Christ. They are fellow members. They are family. You see, membership isn't just joining a club or joining some sort of organization or whatever. You know, they have the same father. Right? And with family, you know, there is a closeness that you don't get from other types of relationships. Anyone who had a family will also tell you families fight a lot sometimes. Right, Mon? Probably fight with your brother. Okay? But you know something? Even when siblings fight, it's special. <laughs> Alright? It's not the same as when we fight outside. Someone else wants to join in the fight, we unite and we fight with the, <laughs> the others. Okay? But here they were a fellow members of the, in the same family and they were a thankworthy church. Look at verse 4. I thank my God always on your behalf. So for the grace of God which is given you by Christ Jesus. Huh? That kind of church? I thought they were, they were having a division, contention, strife. They were carnal. They, there was fornication going on. There was all sorts of nonsense. Paul, how could he thank God for that kind of church? But you see, he's thanking God for the grace of God which is given you. The grace of God is the work of God and God's not done with that church. Neither is he done with you, neither is he done with this church. Right? Because here what we see today is that there we are very much immersed in a church culture where, oh, the first sign of trouble and there's problems, whoever, it's time to go, I need to shop around for another church. Okay? And the problem is this, that we can run into the issue where we shop around and we shop around and shop around and then we finally find a perfect church only that when we join, we ruin the church. Or you're going to find, this, this is what happens most of the time in reality, is that that was a mask. That was a veneer. And once you peel that away, you find that the reality is very, very different. And sometimes here's the problem because when we seek out what looks to be outwardly perfect, you could end up marrying the wrong person. But, but, but you know, from all the specifications and all the outward you know, appearance and everything, it seems okay. And what I want to do today as we deal with this is to realize we need to have a very fundamental basic shift away from that kind of mindset and thinking to realize that churches and people that God is dealing with have their faults, have their flaws, the, but the question we must ask is, uh, is God taking them through a process of sanctification, of growth, of maturity? Do you see change? Okay? Now, I changed my viewpoint in terms of preparing people for marriage because I no longer look for, well, is this the right man, the right woman, or whatever. I'm looking, are they dedicated to following the Lord? Because if they are, no matter how imperfect they may be, these two people come together, God can deal with them through His Word and through the Holy Spirit and through the teaching and preaching of God's Word. You know what? They can be corrected, they can change, they can grow. And you're going to see a transformation. And so what happens? He, he gives thanks to them. He says, I thank, God my, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Christ, Jesus Christ. Now, look at verse 5 because he then tells them they were equipped just like any other New Testament church by God. Look at verse 5. That in everything ye are enriched by Him in all utterance and in all knowledge. Wow. Do you, do you see what he's saying here? Okay? In everything, this church in Corinth had everything that they need. God had already given them everything that they need, all right, that they are enriched by who? Not by the preacher, not by the pastor. 
Just by God. Alright? In all utterance and in all knowledge. Oh, you see, this refutes the idea, well, you know, those, those people need to be taught more, they need to be discipled more. You see, that's why they have all these problems. Do you realize he, Paul said they had all knowledge? All right, and all utterance, and all the preaching, and all whatever was declared in the word of God. And, and then look at verse 6. There was a solid testimony of salvation. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. Confirmed. There's no ifs or buts, not, well, you know, maybe I think these people, maybe they're not, they're not safe, whatever. You realize that safe people can mess up? That's not a license or excuse. But here, Paul knew one thing. He wrote to them, he said, look, there is the assurance and certainty about your salvation. It is, when are you going to live up to the fact that God had called you into this, new, into this vocation as his saints? All right, it says, testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. Saved, sanctified, all right, set apart, right? Members, joined as members of this church. It says they were equal to any church during the New Testament time. Look at verse 7. So that ye come behind in no gift, they're not second class. God did not shortchange them. So they come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the waiting for the soon return of the Lord Jesus Christ is one of the identifying marks of a disciple of Christ. One of the things that you, you watch for in terms of the evidence of salvation. But here, since they don't come behind, in, as far as gifts, spiritual gifts and all these things, they don't come behind any other church. Wow. In other words, this is a 100% legitimate, all right, New Testament church, okay, that belongs to Jesus Christ. Look at verse 8. They will promise Christ's preservation. Who shall also confirm you unto the end. They don't come behind anyone, but says Christ is the one that will work in them to confirm them right unto the end. He's not done with them. That ye may be blameless. They are not blameless now. Not at the point that when Paul was writing to them, he says, but that ye may, may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, wow. Pastor, that's maybe. Right? There's a probability that you may be. Wow, it's not a sure thing. Look at the next verse. God is faithful. By whom you were called unto the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And he's telling them, look, God is faithful. He's going to finish this. Yeah. Right? Christ is still doing the work of sanctification in their lives. Right, and preserving this church and preserving them so much more that he's polishing them everything in every way to increase their, their purity progressively. It is not something that happens overnight. Right? I, I said this during my last trip here. Says one, of my, one of the things that greatly encourages me is that each time I come, I see marks of progress. I see growth, I see changes, I see you know little things. This is improvement, improvement. And that's the mindset that we need to have. Okay? In realizing this, also realize that each and every one of us here, we are players in this. We are involved as members of this church. Right? That we have our part to play. You all contribute one way or another to this progress, to this improvement. Beginning with our individual lives. Right? Our individual lives, our marriage, our family, and then uh, you know, as to this church. Now, so in other words, he affirmed that were many wonderful things about the church in Corinth because of what God has been doing. Right? Because of the work of God, because of the grace of God. But then now he reminds them of also other facts. Okay? Because here 
Although we know this church that has a bad reputation throughout the scriptures, all right, realize this, they are not second class. And it also doesn't mean that the other churches did not have serious problems, all right, because why? The only thing was this, God did not document the problems in the other churches. This was given as an example, it's given for us to understand, you know, how do we approach this? How do we deal with these issues? So now, having established all this, right, in his relationship with them as the missionary that started the church, and he reminds them about all this, now he starts to address the problems. Okay? Now think about this because as parents, we, we, we tend to do it the other way around also sometimes with our kids. We come in, why do you do this? Why do you do that? How come did I tell you? And so on and so forth. And when we need to sometimes deal with it in a different way. You know, sometimes it's like, oh, I can imagine maybe years back, you know, Jong, where we know, Jong, don't you realize we are maklang awas? That's not how we handle things. We don't live like this. Right? We don't respond in that manner. Paul is telling them, look, you are a child of the king. Right? A child of God <coughs> purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. When are you going to live up to that? So with that in mind, he now addresses the problems they experienced in this church. One was that of a lack of unity. Verse 10, he said, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing. You realize the, the one place all right, that we can have a unity and agreement in terms of doctrine and practice is in the local New Testament church. You can't do this universally because right, the moment you even step outside of the bounds of the, the physical bounds of as, as, as a church here, you're going to find we don't always agree on, the, on things. And you go, you spread further out, you find there's a lot of areas of disagreement. But here it says, he, he pleads with them, he said, look, please, I beseech you, brethren, so by the name of our Lord, it says in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, see, speak the same thing. Now, you can't speak the same thing unless people spend time, a lot of time together with each other. Yeah. You notice that husbands and wives, after a number of years of marriage, they, they start to talk the same way. They think the same way. You know, it comes from a close walk in relationship. As members of the church, right? The time that they spend together, they speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you. To what extent? You notice, he says, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Okay? To be, okay, not need to have the same mind, but it says in the same judgment, how? How we arrive at the conclusion, the process, in other words, the way of thinking. We have come to be so close to be so in unity, in sync with one another, that what? We know how to process, evaluate, or judge something in the same way. You get what I'm saying here? Now, one of the, of course, practical areas where you're going to see this is if you, the choir comes up here, they have to be of the same mind. Correct? Oh, wait, wait. You have to be singing in the same key. Imagine someone singing in minor key, the other one is in the major key, and someone is off key. It'll be chaos. You have to be of the same mind. All right? There's a point where we deal with the dynamics. Parts are loud and certain parts are very soft, and then you don't want someone else going loud during the parts when it's supposed to be soft. Okay? You will always know a choir that's singing well and they've rehearsed well together. Physically, they are so in sync that when they to pause to take a breath or whatever, they even move together. They will even go off-key together. Yeah. A good choir will go off-key together. Okay, no clashing. Okay, 
the times we will end something and then we're just slightly flat or slightly sharp. But if everyone is rehearsing together over and over again, we are always perfectly in sync. And here it tells them, right? He tells them, he says, be perfectly joined together. You and I make a commitment the moment we are baptized into the membership or transferred into the membership of a New Testament church to be joined. But here, Paul says, join completely. How do you join completely? You don't hold back. Yeah. You don't hold back. Wow, you know, I, I agree with this church, you know, Pastor, but when it comes to this issue, or whatever, you're not joined completely. Why? Because I'm kind of having to hold back, restrain myself on some things. Here, he, he pleads with them. He says, please, be joined together, perfectly together. This is in the same mind and in the same judgment. So not just the way you think, but in the application of that. Okay, now I've been accused of this, that, oh, you know, there were some who were trying to actually stir up division and they said, oh, well, Pastor Jesse, you know, his people, his people, what do you mean my people? We're all the same members of the same church. What do you mean my people? Do I have a faction here? But there were those that, who had decided that we would all want to be perfectly joined. Right? Same mind, same judgment. And that was why we were in sync. Sometimes, you know, it amazes me because, because we have the same scriptures, right? same Bible, same Holy Spirit. The men who are teaching in the Sunday school, now I don't uh, centrally control everything that is actually going to be taught. Right? We have certain other classes. Uh, but those who are attending those classes will know that sometimes whatever happened in that earlier class during the preaching it fit perfectly we were in sync and the, throughout the week I was not talking to these men about oh you do this you do this and then I will do this and then we'll kind of dovetail everything together no it, it just the Lord worked it out that way now he pleads with them okay to stop the fighting, the contention, right? Why? Because discord in the church is destructive, it is depressing, and it's discouraging, and it needs to stop. Amen. Okay? Not in the Asian way. Now, this is where our culture will come to clash. Our Asian way is what? We avoid conflict. It's there. It's simmering underneath. We don't talk about it. We just suppress it. That's not how it works. All right, but here it says they were to come to that common ground, right? Be perfectly joined together. They all speak the same thing, right? In the same mind, same judgment. Okay, now, guys, say this. Some of us here, we may not be in sync. Now, I understand if you're a new member here, however, it takes time, right? But be open. Search the scriptures, right? Be prayerful. Right? And if you have a heart to, you know, these are my brethren, this is my family, you know, your heart is open, let the Lord lead. Okay? I have no problem with, even with a member, and, I, and sometimes I tell them, look, it's okay. I don't expect you to be perfectly in sync. It's going to take time. But can you keep an open mind and an open Bible? All right? And it's okay for you to admit that. I'm not going to make you my enemy. Because why? Growth takes time. Every parent knows this. You notice how our children, when they're young, they're not in sync with us. What was the first word, that, one of the first words that our little children learned? All right, so you will know this soon because you're expecting, you're going to have, uh, you're going to have kids soon. What was the first words that uh, a child will learn? No! 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 Sometimes they try to be cute. No. But no, it's still no. Why? Right? They want their own way. Right? And then parents, moms are like pulling their hair. Out. Why? What happened to my little angel? Suddenly, why did she become this way? Okay. But how do we deal with this? Patiently, firmly. Lovingly. 
How many parents here, you, you bully your little one into submission? You don't. But they may be wrong and we have to deal with this now. Do we bully them? Crush them so completely that now they are totally enslaved to our thinking? No. Then why do we insist that this is the way it's done in church? Hmm? You see, that's why one of the interesting things is that you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and you can see in the qualifications of the pastor, it talks about what kind of husband and what kind of father he is. That will give you a clue as to the kind of pastor and the way he will deal with things in church. It took me many years to figure that one out. Not just, oh, is he married? Is he, does he have children? You know, are they well behaved? No, no, no. In what way are they well behaved? Okay? Well, we'll kind of deal with that one more during the conference, so I'm not going to spend too much time on that. Now, he tells them, look, he pleads with them to be united because they were having contentions. Verse 11, For it had been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe. Oh, these people reported to Paul. Terrible. It says it was reported, right, by them. It says of the house of Chloe, that's not a family, the members of the church, that there are contentions among you. Right? Well, he was away. And understand this. Only by pride cometh contention. Proverbs 13 verse 10. Only. That, that word is a very, very exclusive word. Only by pride cometh contention. Now, but with the well advice is wisdom. Now, this gives us a clue. Okay? There was contention. There were divisions among them. Comparing scripture with scripture, Proverbs 13 verse 10 tells us that it's only by pride. Now, this helps us to understand the rest of the chapter because what was, there was a battle that was going on in that church. Okay? What was the battle? The issue was about, is it about me or the Savior? Is this going to be a me-centered church Right? And that's why they were having contentions. It's, you know, this church ought to go my way. The walls ought to be my choice of color. All right? Uh, you know, the way things ought to be run ought to be according to the way I think. Okay? And it doesn't matter if it's the member, the deacon, or the, the pastor. Every time someone says it's about me instead of about, it's about the Lord Jesus Christ, that church, that church has gone off balance. Okay? Because this whole chapter, it, when you really condense everything down, it hinges on this issue. What is the nature, the flavor, the character, of the a personality of a church? Is it about me? Is it about the personality of the pastor? Right? Is it about the style and the personality of the pastor imprinted on all the members so that they come out. And, and I've seen churches where the members are clones of the pastor. They walk, talk, say exactly the same things. Now, not based on unity, but based on what? It's a form of customer training. Customer service training, I mean. And it is going to be, is it about a me-centered church, a man-centered church, or a Christ-centered church? Okay, and Paul, Paul, he confronts them because he said they have become man-centered and they were man followers now, and that was why things were a mess yeah. in the church. That's right. Why? Because now, if you go to the Book of Judges and you read that and study that from uh, from end to end, what was the most famous verse or verses? It's repeated a few times. In those days, there was no king. But every man doeth that which is right in his own eyes. What was that? Humanism. With humanism comes pragmatism. Now, humanism is still humanism, even if you dress it up to look Christian. 
Even if you tr- sprinkle Bible verses, humanism robs Christ of his proper place on the throne. Right? Humanism is such that where Christ was on the throne, what do we do? We basically kick him out and then it says, me, I'm here now. I decide what is truth. I decide what is right. Not the Lord. And I put it to you that the majority of churches, this is what they've become. Me-centered, man-centered, humanism in Christian clothing. But it's not a Christ-centered church. Our lives, our marriages, our families can also be that way if we don't guard ourselves. Look at verse 12. He tells them they were man-centered and man-following. He says, Now this I say, that every one of you said, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, right, Peter, and I of Christ. You know, the first group of people that Paul confronted were what? The members of his own fan club. Why? Because he didn't come to build up his following or his, or his fan club. Okay? Paul was so focused about this that, can you imagine, all the Paul followers must have been disappointed. Oh, Paul, we love you. You know, we support you all the way or whatever. And then he says, you know what? He says, everyone, you say, I'm a Paul. Then, uh, Oops. I'm a Apollos. Why? Apollos was one of the, was a brilliant Brilliant orator. Okay, gifted verbally. He could preach with much power. Very engaging, very exciting. Paul, on the other hand, was so boring that when he preached, somebody fell out the window and died. I guess he probably wouldn't get too many invitations to preach at conferences. They will, get, they will ask Apollos, not, not Paul. Yeah. And then Paul wouldn't stop. Paul, I mean, he just wouldn't stop. You know, he writes in his epistle, finally, my brethren, and then two late chapters later, he ended. <laughs> I know. <laughs> my, I, was, I was telling uh, Milka just now, my record was five and a half hours. Okay. So if you include the interpretation divide by half, it's still, you know, it's still about 2.7, 2.8 hours or so. Okay, but that was a, a group of people, a hundred of them, that were serious about the word of God because that morning, everyone had to queue up for rice in the refugee camp. If you were not in the queue, you don't eat for the next seven days you and your family, a hundred people stayed there and said, you know what, we would rather hear the word of God. You know, I cannot imagine not eating for seven days. Okay, that's not even a diet, that's starvation. And they were serious. So I had to get serious about things and then we, we, we really dealt with the word of God and it was a good meeting. But understand this is here, okay, Paul, Apollos, then some say, Peter, Peter, he, he was the one, you know, who was very close to Jesus. We need to be followers, be fans of Paul. Right? Or uh, Peter, Paul was the what? Newcomer. Peter was the original one. Right? We, we need to be close to him. And then there were always, there's always going to be someone who's more spiritual than everybody else. You, all of you follow men. I am the most humble one. I follow Christ. (laughs) Christ, not all this. Look at verse 13 because what was Paul's reply to all of them? Is Christ divided? Huh? Is it was Paul crucified for you? Or will he baptize 
All right, in the name of Paul. Why? Because Paul said, look, I may have baptized a whole bunch of you people here, but what happens? He says, I baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's not me. All right, and their focus was on the men in the church. They were fixated on following men. And we see this all the time. Churches get caught up with what? Personalities instead of the person of Christ. How do you know? Very simple. You say something negative about a man. Watch. Because many times, the wrath and the anger in response to what you said, whether it's something, maybe, it's, it doesn't have to be negative. Maybe it's just not complimentary. They take greater offense when you say something about men than if someone were to blaspheme Christ. Yeah. Am I right? Yes. You've seen it. Alright, and that always tells me, it's always an indication to me, something's wrong. Alright, because it says, here Paul's answer is very simple. It says, is Christ divided? No, he's not. Okay, in fact, one his final prayer before his arrest, he prayed and asked the Father that, you know, that the disciples would be so united, so intimate in their fellowship, that it was like the indivisible fellowship that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit had. Says so that they would be one just as we are one. Right, I think it was John chapter 17. He says, look, Christ is not divided. He says, well, did, he says I'm the apostle. Okay, Paul says, look, I'm Paul, but was I crucified for you? No. Christ was crucified. Right? You're not baptized in the name of Paul. You're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And his point is, so what is all this? Right? This contention, this division, right? this man following... His bottom line point was this. None of them were anything special. They were only servants. Only servants. Look, if God calls you to go to a place, all right, you realize this. It doesn't matter how dangerous the place is. It doesn't matter what the risk is. I am his servant. I am expendable. What if his purpose was for me to die there? What am I going to do? Am I going to obey? Or am I going to say, well, well, you know, under the circumstances, you realize this is very dangerous, it's not, it is very risky. Look, his point was this. This is not about following men. Okay? Today, this is where we are. Oh, is this church, are they part of uh, so-and-so's group? Are they part of another group? Are they aligned with this, aligned with that? And Paul says, look, these men did not die for you. They were not crucified for you. You were not baptized in their name. Okay, and by the way, I, I've been in to Myanmar a number of times and this issue of baptism was a, a, a very touchy issue. Because the church, in the churches among the Baptists, it matters who baptized you. You know? Oh, no, no, no. I, I don't want, you know... Uh, Dale to baptize me, you know. I want Pastor Matlang Awa to baptize me. Hey, look, where the New Testament church gives the authority to men to do the, to perform that ordinance. That's it. Yeah. Some will say, you know, uh, what's that last month the, the wedding? Oh, I don't want you know, I don't want Wilson to officiate and, and preach at the wedding. I want somebody else to do it. Do you realize what Paul was addressing is there is no room for that in the New Testament church. Right? Because it can happen and we have, okay, I had to deal with this because by the time I took over as a senior pastor, there were three, I was the third pastor already. Okay? And you can have a situation where some follow the missionary 
Some follow the previous pastor and some will follow, you know, follow the current pastor. And what do I do? I say, look, don't follow me. Okay? That's, but I'm following Christ. Let's go the same direction. Let's go together. Because if you just follow me, then what's going to happen to the next man? And the next man? Now, we're clear. We have to obey the Lord and follow all right, the pastor. Hebrews 13 verse 7, you know this. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. All right? But, remember, whose faith follow. What kind of faith? All right? Stay so follow the word of God. You follow them. Is it considering their conversation, the way they live? Okay? And the way they live could could actually cancel this thing out if, if they're not careful. Right? They, so he rebukes them, right? Because of that, this being man-centered. Now, very quickly, we're just going to look at the next few verses here because what happens? Because of this issue of division, there was personal loyalty that was assigned. Okay? I thank God, verse 14, that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, and I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom or words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Okay, so what happens? He limited the number of people that are in Corinth that he had baptized, he, had de he delegated the authority to others. Right? Christmas guys along with the household of Stephanus, but he said, uh, as far as he's concerned, he doesn't remember who else. Okay? And, and so the point was that, look, this is not about factions, not about man following, it's not about what? Personal loyalty. Okay? Their loyalty should be to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Right? Who is the head of the church, not the pastor. It's the head of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? And, you know, Paul was wise in limiting, you know, how many he baptized, but he actually then gave the authority to others. Now, by the way, the Lord Jesus Christ did the same thing. Do you realize in John chapter 4? Okay? The chapter, John chapter 4 actually tells us that Christ baptized more disciples than John the Baptist. But, he said, but he did not personally do the baptizing. Why? Can you imagine the trouble it would have caused? Someone said, I had the original baptism from Jesus. You only were baptized by John. Right? Or you only were baptized by Peter. But mine came from Jesus. And, you know, you can get caught up with all this kind of stuff. Here, right? This is in the fallen sin nature of man. Right? We attach a special status, right? And then even personal loyalty to certain men. Now, home in of verse 17, because he said, look, his purpose wasn't to come to baptize. Okay? Which ought to make a lot of Baptist churches think again, because the emphasis over the decades has shifted towards baptizing, making members. And I'm not saying that I believe in a universal church. I believe we should baptize members into a local New Testament church. But notice, his emphasis was on the salvation of these people. He said, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. But not only to preach, notice what kind of preaching actually matters. Alright? He says, not with wisdom or words. He's talking about what? Human wisdom. You see the issue of humanism comes back again? Alright? He says, not with, the wisdom, not with wisdom or words. How many times have you and I seen a discussion on any issue all right, concerning doctrine or practice and someone merely offers human reasoning? I cannot find chapter or verse to support any of that. Right. Only human reasoning. And here it says, 
What is the problem with human reasoning? It says, let the cross of Christ be made of none effect. Now, look, the danger of our own human wisdom is this. It cancels out the wisdom of God. It is totally opposed to the wisdom of God and it will cancel it out. It will nullify it if we allow it to prevail. Whether in our ministry philosophy, in the way we govern the church, New Testament church, right? in the way we preach even, you have to be very, very careful. Paul's goal was very clear. It's not, he's not there to impress the audience. Okay? The words of men, the, these words of wisdom could cause the gospel to be weakened to the point where it's no longer effective. Example. Have you noticed how it's always so tempting that, oh, well, we preach the gospel, the Bible defines what the gospel is, right? We have lots and lots of scriptures to, as to how we should present the scriptures, uh, how to present the, the gospel scripturally. How is it suddenly when it comes to children, we find that we need to present it in a different way and to make it easier for them to get saved? Where do we get that from? The wisdom of man. Is there more than one way of salvation? No. Then why do we have to water it down? Why do we have to change it? Why do we take, for instance, what is there and tamper with it to tune it so that so-called we can secure more decisions when God has laid out one, one way for all men to be saved? Now, if you turn to Romans chapter 1, verse 16, I want us to see here what is at heart is also an uh, issue of man's heart concerning this matter. All right? Romans 1 verse 16. Look, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? Look at the next word, for. It means because. Right? Because. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. Nowhere does it mention man's power. Right? Or someone's soul winning prowess and skill. It's talking about what? The power of God is, the, is what saves us. It says, to everyone that believeth, right? To the Jew first and also to the Greek. The power of God. Now, let me cast that in the light of where we are today. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I put it to you that there are many Baptists who are ashamed of the gospel. They don't believe it can change or transform someone. That's why we must have political campaigns, public pressure on politicians to effect righteousness. Why? Because they don't believe the gospel can make a difference. They don't believe that the preaching of the cross can totally change and transform someone. We have to ban the places of gambling, the places of prostitution, the places of, you know, of alcohol, or whatever. You know how it was, how, it, how did those places shut down during the times of the Great Revival era? Lack of demand. Why? so many conversions, people stopped doing those things. Their lives would change. They were never the same again. We dealt with that in Acts chapter 19 yesterday, right? Yeah. What happened? Paul preached the gospel such that a whole bunch of people after that got saved and when they got saved, they turned. They turned, to the, they turned from idols to the true and living God they forsook those idols. There was no more demand. Business slump. The silversmith making those idols were going out of business and they were upset. And they said, it's Paul's fault. 
Okay? They didn't go around with a protest outside the bar or the nightclub and say, shut it down, shut it down. You know, we call on the mayor, we have a meeting with the mayor or whatever and say, look, you know, our church and our, 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 our group of churches, you know, we represent 60% of the member, you know, of the, of the citizenship in this town here. Do you realize we can vote you out of office? You know, you need to change this. You need to do something about this. You know, it says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power, power of God unto salvation. Why? Because when God does the work of saving someone, He will do the work of transforming someone also. But you see, we have moved away from that. We have now ashamed. We think, you know, this is not sufficient. We must try something else. And I put it to you, all right, that the churches that have, are doing that have now betrayed right. the gospel. There is no other social change agenda other than one person getting saved at a time. Then you notice what, what Paul was talking about in the earlier verses. Sanctify, called to be saints. The Lord doing the work of sanctifying someone. Right? Because this is still what will make a difference? Now he says it's not by the wisdom of man. It is by the conviction of the Holy Spirit, not by how eloquent Apollos was, all right, and he was a very eloquent man. It is not by how good the illustration is. Or how fancy the title of the message. I, didn't, I don't even have a title for this message. Okay? Paul's final authority was this. Amen. The scriptures. What the word of God says. Right? Nothing else. Because if, if this will not be our f starting point and our ending point, church, can I recommend this? Just close shop. Shut down. Disband go do something else. But we're not going to make this the start and the end of everything. Okay? And it must begin with not only us as individuals, but with every preacher that, you know, I'm, when we're going to preach something, I'm not here to preach the title of the sermon. I'm not going to preach the outline. I'm not saying outlines are bad. But I've seen a lot of very bad preaching on, on outlines because they only preach the outline. They don't preach the text. All right? And we're not going to deal with this and that we're going to submit to this instead of, well, the preacher comes along and says, okay, close your Bible now. Here's what I think. You know what? If you find yourself in a church like that, run! Get out! And don't come back. Because this must be the first and foremost and the final authority that settles everything for us. Okay? And here we must realize we have to Go back to one very basic thing. Man, there is no room for man in the New Testament church. Now, according to my notes here, I'm only at a halfway point. Okay? But, let me do this. I'm going to read the scriptures. Alright? I'm going to say a few things and then so that we can wrap up. So I don't want to kind of do a second episode. Okay. Look at verse 18 onwards. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Okay, what was he saying? To lost people, the preaching of the cross is ridiculous. Nonsense. It offends men's wisdom. Okay? And you have to realize this sometimes is still an ongoing issue even after we're saved or in church because why? there is an ongoing conflict between what God has to say versus our thinking. And that's why we're told, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, right? That to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Why? Because if you don't have a renewed mind, the word of God is going to constantly offend you. I don't like, I don't think this is going to work. Really? Why don't you just settle that this is your final authority? Let's, let's do what I call 
Okay, what the old saints call experimental faith. Okay, it's not experiential faith. What is experimental faith? The scripture says this is true. I will apply it. And I expect God to provide the correct results because this is what it says. And as this happens, as the results come, and the Lord brings out the, the correct result, what happens? It further strengthens my faith because I know this is true. All right? In science, what do we do? We conduct an experiment to prove and to confirm what the theory already tells us. Okay? Now, the, if you go back to the 1800s and earlier, they talked about experimental faith. Today, everything shifted to experiential faith. Okay? I believe this. I hold this to be true. Now, it says here that it is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved. What happens? It is. It is the power of God. Now, if we just dwell on that verse alone, it will, there was a lot of implications on, on us. You know, sometimes we think, oh, well, uh, someone's not growing, whatever, you know, um, you know uh, maybe it's got to do with the way we do our ministry. Maybe it's got to do with our preaching, whatever. It's not about man. It must first begin with the power of God to save someone, and then after that, that begins the work of God in somebody. Now, look at verse 19, because now Paul elaborates further about this issue about man versus God, humanism versus Christ being Christ-centered. It says here, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. Do you see that? I would be very afraid if you and I were dwelling and focusing only on our own wisdom, our own intellect. Now, I will dis- God says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. He says, I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. I wish people would read this and understand this because we would, then we would not have had the historical problems that we had, for instance, in churches uh, with deacons. Why? Right? They picked deacons. It shifted from being godly and spiritual men of faith to picking deacons because of their business experience, financial experience and knowledge, and their business connections. Is this here, you realize that I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent? The prudent will say, well, pastor, I don't think now's the time. We don't have the budget to do this. What about faith? What about praying and trusting that the Lord will provide? Because if this is the path and the indication that He is set for me, all right? If I'm supposed to go to this country, it's, do you realize I just have to obey? It is God's job to provide the finances, the visa, and all the open doors. That's His job, not mine. I just have to obey. It says here, be careful because it says, I will bring to nothing. It says, the understanding of the prudent. All right? Look at the rhetorical questions here. Where is the wise? So where is the scribe? All right, where are the scholars? Where is the disputer of this world? It says, had not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? That's why I'm not impressed by that. Okay? And you see this all the time because right, people who will offer all their wisdom in all its glory but never once go back to chapter and verse to tell you why. Yeah. Yeah. I don't bother. Because look at this. Where does this wisdom lead to? Destruction. Look at verse 21. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Okay? It says, by the world, by its own wisdom, led itself to where it, it erased the knowledge of God. Okay? Humanism, secularism, atheism, Everyone of man's philosophies is by the world by its by wisdom knew not God. Okay, what happened? It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. 
the foolishness of preaching was given to us by the wisdom of God. It's absurd to us. It's ridiculous to men. And yet God in His wisdom said, this is the way. This is how it's going to work. All right? To lost men, this is crazy. It says what? Someone, God became a man, was executed, died the death of a common criminal so that my sins can be forgiven, but I'm a good person. I didn't murder anyone. I didn't cheat people of money. <coughs> and the preaching of the cross says what? There's none righteous. No, not one. Wasn't even talking about your sin yet. You're saying your righteousness is, doesn't even count. It doesn't measure up even to God's standard. Doesn't meet God's requirement even. And here, it says here that God had ordained that it will be by the foolishness of preaching, right? And this defied man's expectations. You see, man today also ca cannot understand how that someone's life could be transformed after salvation just by the teaching and preaching of God's word and then by reading and prayer. They're like, no, you need to have programs. You need to have this and that. You need to have a buddy, you know, a discipleship partner, whatever. Then you breathe down that person's neck so that you make sure that they do all the right things. You know, uh, man's wisdom says, oh, oh, this is vacation time. We need to make sure the programs are there, everything, so that all the members or the young people are so busy they have no time to commit sin. That's the wisdom of man. We're trusting in the power and the might of man, not in the Word of God, not in the Holy Spirit of God, not in the salvation work of the Lord. Man's wisdom. Right? Man's wisdom dictates, you know, we, there are certain things we need to do. Oh, if the, you know, if the finances are, are, we're having some problems and things are tight, you know, I need to guilt trip everyone, manipulate everyone into giving more. Instead of maybe either simply communicating that there is a need and we pray about this and then let the Lord deal with everyone. Okay, we come up with all sorts of devices. Here, it says, you know what happened? It says, this foolishness to men created all sorts of problems. Verse 23, for the Jews require a sign. They were looking for signs. It says, and the Greeks after wisdom. Simple, plain preaching from the Bible does not impress a Greek mind. And by the way, most of modern education is based on Greek philosophy and principles to today. Okay? Um, one example of this is this. The content is not so important. The narrative is important. How you say it. You see, how I preached this message to the Greek was more important than what has to be said. That's how modern movies are made. It must have that sensuality to bring across the emotional impact, to draw that out. Okay? You know, you know how the... Today, how does the camera work? You come, you pan slowly, zoom in. You see her eyes, her face, and then you move slowly across some, uh, no, the actress, her body. You must have the right kind of lighting to create the effect. You know what happened in, what was it? Song of Solomon. How, how, how does the Hebrew mind work? Oh, her teeth are like the sheep and whatever. Her neck is like the Tower of David. You know, her uh, eyes are like, you know. And, and if you read those descriptions, we, we laugh today. Right, Song of Solomon. We read those. Like, huh? How do you describe a woman like that? Because why? It's based on the value, functional value. Not the sensuality. 
You get what I'm saying here? All right. So what happens now? To the Greeks, this this message is ridiculous. It's brutal. It's violent. All right. Unnecessary. There's blood everywhere. All right. This is a bloody religion. He keeps talking about the blood of Christ, the blood of Christ, the blood of Christ. So it's offensive to man. And then, you know, I, I don't feel good about myself. All right? The message is, you, know, you have offended a holy and righteous God. I'm offended. I came to church here to feel good. You know, the pastor was supposed to be very hospitable and friendly. Everyone's supposed to be nice and warm to me so that I feel good, so that I don't, you know, it soothes my guilty conscience so that I come back again and again and I'll be happy to give in the offering. You know, the wisdom of men. This is but unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. All right? Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Now, it's very clear there is no room for man, his philosophy, his intellect, his thinking, all right, his, his every one of this. Man has no room at all. Not in the New Testament church. That's why it's reflected even in the composition of the membership. For ye see your calling, brethren, how there are not many wise men after the flesh, right? So not many intellects, not many great minds and thinkers, simple men. That's why many times the Baptist preachers are despised. Say, what do you know? You don't have a doctorate. You have no degrees, all right? You know, how many books have you written? None. All right? How many papers have you written? None. Is this not many... What was that? Not many wise men after the flesh. Why? What you and I want is wisdom. How? Scriptural wisdom. Godly wisdom. Godly wisdom where in chapter 2, Paul points out we have the mind of Christ. If you're saved, you have the mind of Christ. All right? You, if you have the word of God, you can transform your... Know, okay? You renew your mind, your mind can be transformed. There is a radical change. Here's not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, right? Not powerful, not many noble, right? Oh, brother so and so is from this distinguished family. Fifth generation Christian. Right? Or is one of the most influential families in the Philippines. You know what? This is not many, if at all. So in Corinth, they didn't have that, all this. No big names. Right? It says, not many noble are called. Why? Look at the reason. But God had chosen the foolish things of the world. That's you and I. Okay? The foolish things of the world. In the eyes of the world, you know what? You guys have wasted an entire morning being here. Yeah. Listening to the most ridiculous thing called preaching. But God had chosen the foolish things of the world. Notice to confound the wise. Okay? I'm not against wisdom, but be careful. Know, be discerning. What kind of wisdom do we need to have? And God had chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. That explains a lot to me as a pastor. Now I know why we never ever have enough budget. We don't have to be mighty in our bank account. God will find a way so that we can still get what we need to do done. 
Oh, if only I know this right person or we have the right connections or, you know, uh, the name of our church is well known or whatever, you know, we can get people to open the doors. Uh, you know, the right bankers are going to come in and they will write, you know, they will write us a check or whatever. No, it says here, God had chosen that it's going to be what? By the foolish things and by the weak things. We see strength all, all the time. There are churches that boast, oh, one, one church, in Singapore boasted that they were able to raise 19 million US dollars on one Sunday for missions. Now, listen. The way it's going to work, God's way is, here they say, what budget do you have? Oh, we don't have budget. Okay. And the Lord's plan is, okay, I'm going to call a few men here and you're going to send them out as missionaries. But, but we don't have budget. It's not going to be by your might. It's not going to be by your might. It's not going to be by your how much material resources you have or your ability to mobilize those things. God's going to show himself mighty. That's how it's going to work. Okay? I will not give up so quickly just because something is perceived as an because there's difficulties now that I will call it a closed door not yet you know why pastor if God has called me and he has directed me until uh, I, this is how I would pray I would pray until Lord if you, if you change your plans for me fine you are going to have to prove it to me bite me on the arm or on my backside because I'm very hard-headed, but until you make it clear that you have changed your plans for me, I am going to keep going because that's what you last, that was your last orders. I'm not going to change that. How? Lord, that's your problem, not mine. My problem is, this is what I have to do, I must do it. Okay? Because that was exactly what happened. 2001, when I surrendered, everyone will tell you, that's not a wise decision. Why? I owed about $80,000 and with no job, both my wife and I, knowing that we were going to quit everything with surrendering, I'm going to be in the ministry. It is a recipe for disaster. The wisdom of the world, the wisdom of man will tell you, you are crazy. But you see, if he calls and he indicates his will for me, how to, that's his problem, not mine. I have every right to request, Lord, you have made your will clear. You have made your plan very clear to me. I am now obeying, but we are stuck, Lord. And because we are stuck, Lord, you have to get us through this. There is no other way. And I am going to increase my dependence on you. All right? Even if everybody calls me a fool. And there are things here at church that we, Lord, the Lord will present before us that sometimes look ridiculous. We say, Lord, we don't know how. This is way too big for us to handle. All right? There's no way we don't have the manpower, we don't have the resources, we don't have the skill, we don't have the experience. Just settle on one thing. What has the Lord indicated? All right? The rest of it, that's his problem, not mine. I have every right to ask for him to supply. Okay? And I will hold the Lord to it, just as he will hold me to whether or not I obey. That's how it works. All right? We just take care of his business. How to? That's his problem. That's his business. I'm going to ask him. Now, here, it says, that's why it says, what else has God chosen? Verse 28, and the and base things of this of the world. Alright? We're low, we're not high class, we're not influencers, we are not people of high status, we are not people who have uh, who are well known or big shots. So the base things of the world and the things which are despised. All right? Who are you? All right? That was John, that was what happened in right Sambala and all that, all that in, in Nehemiah chapter four. Was, who, who are these Jews? Who do they think they are? 
All right? Independent Baptist Church, Assembly, who do they, these people think they are? It says what? The base things. The things that are, which are despised had God chosen. And what, where God has chosen, He doesn't make a mistake. Amen. He doesn't make a mistake. What was his purpose? Look at verse 28. To bring to naught the thing that uh, bring to naught things that are. Alright? It says he uses the nothing, all the nobodies, all right, all the base things, all the people who are despised. To bring to nothing the things that are. And yet, so much of modern Christianity today is focused on what? You got to be somebody. Why? Because, and here's, here's the lie, the lie of the devil, you need to be somebody so that you can draw and attract and influence more people. The largest church in my country, what, what did they do? They said, we need, right? They said, Madonna and the world tour uh, needed about $70 million. They said, we need about the same amount of money, $70 million, in order to reach the whole world in the goal of Go to everyone. We need to make the pastor's wife a top-selling pop star, and they spend fifty million to buy their way into the industry. Why? Because it's based on this: that if you and I become famous or popular, we become big shots. We will draw all men to Christ. What did the Bible say? Say, if I be lifted up. I will draw all men, not you, not a big shot, not a celebrity, and yet the, so much of the wisdom of men today is right. We need to make sure, you know, the most popular actor in the Philippines becomes a Baptist. Right? We make Mani Pacquiao a Baptist, and then he will draw everybody. Was Mani Pacquiao crucified for you? No. Do you see how dangerous, how toxic the wisdom of man is when it enters into the New Testament church? And God says, well, He will do it the opposite. Right? Nothings, the nobodies. Okay? I'm enjoying my freedom to preach uh, when I travel, you know, because I'm nobody. Nobody knows who I am. Okay? I got no reputation. Maybe now I have a bad reputation. I don't know. Okay? But I'm not a celebrity and, you know, I'm free to say what this has to say. But this is to bring to naught, bring to nothing the things that are. All right? And yet, so many times here, we want to be somebody, to be something. That there's a whole bunch of preachers that went out, put down some money to buy a doctorate degree. Why do you need that? If you can't even study the scriptures for yourself and you want to put down a title to your name, what purpose is that? Okay? A pig with makeup is still a pig. Okay? Maybe it's got nice lips, but you know, it's still a pig. A chimpanzee in a tuxedo is still a chimpanzee. But here we... We, we think that this is going to be what will change. Now, the purpose, why did God do it this way? Why doesn't God just make it easier on every one of us? Look at verse 9. It says that no flesh should glory in His presence. Alright? You see, no flesh should be allowed to glory in His presence, not in the New Testament church. There is no room. Wherever God is, all right, where He takes up residence, all right, beginning with the tabernacle, when the, if, you, if you go back to the Old Testament and you study it, it's amazing that when Moses dedicated the tabernacle, you know what happened? The glory, the Shekinah glory of God filled the tabernacle. You know what happened? The next verse is, the priest could not enter in. It's like all the Shekinah glory filled the tabernacle and poof, all the priests were just kicked out. They couldn't enter. And then it happened again when Solomon dedicated the temple. No room for the priest, no room for man when God's glory fills up the entire house of God. 
here. Okay, and by the way, it happened, there was another indication on the day of Pentecost, the flames came down on every believer and that was, again, the glory of the Lord came. There was no room for man. Here in the New Testament church, there's no room that no flesh, no human flesh should glory in His presence. You know why? Christ must be number one. Amen. Must be number one. This is not Pastor Joel's church. Yeah. Right? This is, you know, it, when it comes to Singapore, it's not my church. Okay? There's no room. There's no flesh of glory in the presence of God. But you notice, know but ye of him, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus. All right? It, they are in Christ Jesus, who of God is made to on, unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Now, there is a replacement that actually goes on here. Because remember, it says there were uh, not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, all right? They were foolish, they were despised, they were weak. But then it says, of him are ye in Christ Jesus. He's talking to the members. All these, right, who are weak, who are foolish, who are despised, who are not, who are not mighty, who are not noble. It says, ye are, ye are in Christ Jesus. And then it says, who is made unto us wisdom. There's a substitution, there's a replacement. It's no longer the wisdom of man, it says now, it's just the wisdom of God. Given to who? The foolish ones. Right? Those who are not mighty. It says, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. You see why? It's all about Him, Amen. not about us. And because of that, it says that according as it is written, this is the fulfillment. It says, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Okay? Let him glory in the Lord. Okay? That's why sometimes, um, especially when I'm traveling, I don't depend on the notes very much. Not because I have great memory. I, I, a lot of times I cannot remember what I ate yesterday. Seriously. And I will fail if you have a memory verse challenge. Okay? But it is that when I, these, especially I take it away, I just take all the notes, I take the outlines, I throw that all aside and say, okay, this is all I'm going to depend on now. I'm going to let him deal with the rest. I'm going to let him give me the wisdom and the power and the might to deal with this. Why? Because when I'm, everything is said and done, I cannot claim the credit. He the glory of it says, let him glory in the Lord. Let him glory in what the Lord has done. Okay? It is terrifying. For someone who cannot remember things well, this is terrifying. But I'm depending on one thing. This is more important than any outline that I can give to you. All right? And, and we need to see here that no, there is no room for man, no room for our, our thoughts. I'm, I'm not saying that man cannot come up with good thoughts and observations, okay? But I, I cringe sometimes, okay? I, I, no, actually, I cringe all the time when someone will quote me on Facebook. I know someone just did last night, okay? And I understand that, I understand, but I don't want to get used to the idea that, you know, quoting me is more important than quoting the scriptures alright because if God's going to do anything whether today or at the conference or at the camp it's going to be by the foolishness of preaching right by the counsel of God's word not because of the power or the eloquence of the preacher okay and here's the problem you see someone can sit here and say wow that was you know, how many minutes have we gone by already? And you know what? Uh, it's okay. I think if you can survive watching the Avengers movie, three hours, you can, you can handle this. But they're going to say, wow, this is, you know, this is boring, whatever. Then he, he didn't, you know, he, he, he didn't uh, jump and do cartwheels and then, you know, swing from one part to the other and then, you know, all these theatrics and whatever. Because why? We don't want 
the preaching to be based on the wisdom of men. I have done all the causes, a whole bunch of causes on presentation, public speaking. I had I actually had professional PR training before, and I'm I won't I don't want to use that. I was a stage actor before. Okay, I've done I've been in a number of drama productions, but you see it's not it cannot be based on those things. All right, and we need to get back to the plain simple. Word of God. But understand this. When you look at chapter 1, we're going to realize, as a church, when we step back, we look around and say, well, you know, we're just a bunch of us. We don't have a lot of budget. We don't have a lot of this and what. It doesn't matter. As long as we are a true church of Jesus Christ and that the hand of God is still on this church and He's working with us, realize this, even through problems, Right? Even through our weakness and how puny and how insignificant we are, if His hand is on us, there is no stopping us. Okay? There's no stopping us. There are many things that are possible because of who He is and because of who we are in respect to our relationship with Him. So as we close here, I want to challenge everyone here. I just want to kind of set the whole ground here for the next few for the coming week alright because no flesh should glory in his presence it's all about him alright but it must begin today with this do you realize maybe some of us here our thinking is humanistic in nature it may be christianized it may have the outward cloak of christianity but it is humanistic. And it, can I say this? It is very toxic to your faith. All right? It will set the word of God and the things of God at, at naught. It will neutralize it. Determine in your heart today that, I, Lord, I will surrender that to you. Replace that, Lord. Take that away. Change the way I look at things. Change the way I think. All right? And then that pray also that as a church that we will be Christ-centered and centered on the word of God on the wisdom of God rather than on the wisdom of man pray and ask that God will give us the wisdom to discern the difference between the two because we need constantly evaluate and make the right judgments and then to reject those things whether it comes from culture it comes from uh, man-made ministry philosophy Right? the wisdom of the world to reject all those things so that God can show himself mighty that he can be the preeminent right? Christ will be number one right? in our lives and in this church right? will you do that let's pray Father thank you Lord for even this time Lord for just